YouTube, what's up? Workflow here, it's been a good minute. Today I'm gonna run you through a pretty simple process. We were shooting some reflective stuff in the studio and I wanted to chime you guys in and just chat about reflective products, how to even approach them. I'm no expert, but we were firing off a few exposures here, having a fun time with those Yong Nuo speed lights. I love them, I link them in the description, but you can use anything and reflective products are certainly a more broad range of items than just watches. Watches serve as a good candidate for what we'll chat about today because there's a complexity to the angles that are coming off a watch. I mean, it's a really wide angle of reflections and it's directly reflective that we'll get into. So it has the potential to be a headache, but we won't let that happen because you guys know and you know if you've shot something reflective, you can really spin your wheels if you don't approach it from a wholesome understanding. But if you can get a grasp on these concepts, you can approach it in a really leveraged way. So just to get started, I mean, check out how we mounted up our product over here. We just applied a bit of tack around a ring. You'd get something like that at a hardware store and I have a little collection of things like that because it's really cool. It gives the product structure, but it allows you to parallax the camera pass such that you open yourself up to some sort of floating vantage points that I really appreciate. And you can get some good stuff captured in camera. Now you may have a different reflective product. The main tip I can give you is to try to keep it still. When you have a static product in an increasingly complex lighting scenario, you can move the lights around and it's like saving your progress by having it still, which allows you to achieve more flattering light and kind of fine tune your decisions. So I got a setup here with a uh, speed light, 64th power, keeping it really low. Cause if you're like me, you might just try shooting a light at a new product just to read how it's kind of behaving. So that'll kind of give you some guidance as to where to go. And I got a two second remote, which just gives me the freedom to move my hands, which can be useful, but you're going to get this kind of characteristically dark lighting. It's not doing anything for anyone and it's not broad enough, not nearly broad enough. This can be useful for like nailing little specific regions like that. Like that could go in my back pocket for a composite scenario. But what you're noticing here is you're not getting that real like bread and butter, meat and potatoes. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but you're not getting that broad lighting that's gonna characterize the watch and get it off the background. You're just specifically lighting little areas. Now, how many of you folks have one of these panels. These things are like dirt cheap and they're really useful because you can light them and then they reflect in your product. And that's gonna unlock some doors as we see in a second. I'm gonna use my custom made one and I have a tutorial on our channel how to make these bad boys if you want one yourself. But the important thing to keep in mind is whenever you're lighting through a diffuser, increase your light power. So I'm gonna increase a few stops here and it'll eat up some of that energy. So again with the timer, And the difference is it's reflecting a large diffused light source now directly instead of a harsh smaller light source. And a little more frontal there. Actually, I'll zoom in because that's kind of a nice, uh, what's the word there, like a shimmer, a little cross through the highlight. Again, we're not quite as broad as I'd kind of like to be. Like I'd like to have a base exposure on our whole light, whereas this is just more of a sophisticated version of this accent in the fact that maybe I could bring this in, but I still need a sort of base solution here at 132nd power. I think we made progress from our original exposures, right? So you can systematically diffuse the light, like yeah, from above, below, every angle imaginable, but listen, you're gonna end up recreating virtually this Ikea lampshade, it's called the Melody, and it wasn't intended to be a photographer's dream, but it is. Few of you know about it, I've covered it before, it got some good traction here on YouTube, and you can check that out on Ikea's website, and tell them Dusty sent you. But you can also just go to an Ikea and go to the section where all the furniture's dinged and it's discounted, and you'll find one of these, because you don't even need the actual light source, you just use the lampshade, it gives you 360 degree coverage with a hole you can peer through to get the shot in camera, it's a pretty beautiful, magical solution. I love to keep things super still now because it gives you a really beautiful canvas to start moving around static lights and making those micro adjustments. So what I'm doing here is the same harsh speed light. I'm just kind of shooting it at the left side of the Melody. So I think it'll give us a nice result, but it'll speak for itself in a minute. And again, let's draw some distinctions from the character of our previous light. So you'll notice something here in that our highlights don't just go from being beautiful highlights to totally going to black. And instead it's a constant gradient similar to a radial gradient. And I have this very close to our watch. So you see the far side, it falls off nice and dark. I actually 
I don't mind the fall off here. It's kind of elegant. You see some light picks up in certain areas and it's much more all encompassing than our previous solution. And this is just after placing one simple speed light. Let's talk about the quality of the light, which I just kind of described as a radial gradient. And we'll move it further away. And we'll see what effect that has on the image. I have an idea of where I'm gonna end up letting it hang out. Just because this isn't my first rodeo. I see we move it far away and I nudge the power up, but we're already starting to catch the far side of the reflection. And there's a bit of a non-reflection happening here at the bottom right. We'll talk about that later at the end of the episode. It's pretty subtle. You see, we're almost able to like wake up our watch in a way the 2D diffusion panel wasn't really allowing us to do. And I just keep turning up my power of my speed light a little bit when I move it further away to kind of compensate. Because effectively, I want a few options like this. I want to be able to look at multiple options and kind of get an idea of the parameters of that lighting scheme and what is being affected. You see, as I broadly light the watch, it loses a certain quality to how quickly the light falls off, which can look quite seductive and nice. So sometimes, despite your brain wanting to see the brightest exposure, sometimes there is a bit of fall off that's nice if you're gonna introduce some fill. Yeah, so it's funny, I mean, I kind of aesthetically preferred the medium distance, I don't know about you, but from a technical standpoint, I liked how the far side of the watch was cut out bright in that other exposure. So to find a middle road, I'm gonna use a fill card. That'll let me retain the aesthetic I prefer in terms of proximity of my light to my subject, but still let me bounce some data into the far side of it, which will open it up and make it a little more pleasing to the eye kind of intuitively. Now I know you guys don't have the best view over there, but all I'm doing is using a paper reflective card and I'm just trying to bounce some light into the far side of the watch. It'll be pretty self-explanatory. Hey guys, I just want to quickly mention in Photoshop, that's such an easy fix. I just want to unpack it really quick because you could waste your time trying to reflect light just into the crown, but not ruining this area, making it ugly, like I said, but it'd be a waste of time because all you got to do is zoom in as long as they're aligned, right? Hold Alt and click this button to give your reflective layer a black mask. Hit B to bring out your brush and with white in your foreground, you can just mask that reflection right in here and it's looking nice and bright. I can fade that in, fade that out and you know effectively just light the side of my watch however I want. Now it's sticking out and it's the reason it's sticking out is because I froze the hands on 10 and 2 so it's looking so juicy it's just asking to be composited slightly more inward towards the watch but we'll unpack that in a little bit let's get back in the studio. So I usually reserve that fill card technique if I'm just trying to bounce a little light into a stubborn area if I'm trying to go for a more respectable like fill at a 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 lighting ratio I might bust out another speed light. And depending on your product, this might be the end solution. Just two speed lights and a Melody. That's a recipe for a nice shot, usually, if you have a reflective product. You don't need a strip box, but I'm gonna use one here just so I can get a broad dispersion to my light. So this is an optional thing. Just use a bare speed light if you want. And just keeping this sort of parallel with our watch, I'm gonna just invoke a bit of a fill here. And that's interesting. I might go for something edgier today. I'm gonna to lower our power one degree. And instead of going for a side exposure, I'm going to bring it back on about a 45 such that it's still parallel this way with the watch and I'll try to get a bit of an edge light going here. And I'm shooting this right into the back of the Melody and I'll just bring these up big so you guys can see them. Because each one has something special and unique about it, kind of like a snowflake. Hey guys, I just want to jump into Photoshop, unpack a few things real quick with some nuance, then send you back into the studio because there's a few tips and tricks here. I have my base exposure and I brought in the card just like last time, but this time we chose a right edge light exposure, so it's a lot brighter. But let me show you why I did that with a bit of foresight. I'm going to bring out selective color as an adjustment above everything. And I'm going to go to this black channel and spend some time playing around with this tool. It's pretty powerful. But you see how quickly I can grab this dark charcoal value and manipulate it. If I bring all these up, it's going to essentially take the pixels which were most susceptible to being black, which was the background much more than the watch, and sort of just hammer them home. Alternatively, you could use curves. I see a lot of people in our Facebook group, links below to join it, use curves, and they prefer it more. You know, they each do their own thing. I find selective color a bit more exact, but curves is good just for a blanket crushing and you could achieve a similar thing that way or maybe with a combination of both. Now we have these bottom scrims and we have the top scrim. Now why do I have these here? Because we can bring them in. I'm gonna grab both these layers 
And I'm going to put them on light mode. First, do you guys know what light mode does? I'm just going to put the top layer in light mode just to illustrate what it does. It only allows... Okay, that's the final image right there, guys. But no, it only allows you to lighten the underlying layer. So now I can grab both these layers, put them on lighten. And effectively, it's like retroactively lighting the top and bottom of my watch. And you can group those, fade them in subjectively. But I want you to know you have that capability if, keyword is if, you're shooting a more nuanced, tricky, reflective item like a watch. Now our dial. Let's scrutinize our dial because it's looking flat. So I'm going to bring out the dial exposure. And you see it had some good shape to it that this didn't have. See how the dial's brighter, but the original watch face is brighter? So if I put on light mode, guess what's going to happen? It's just going to seamlessly blend in. This may appear to be a convoluted mess of lighting modification, but let's group everything. Control G, going to make a new layer uh, below it. Fill that in with black. BG. What we're going to do with this layer now, hit L to bring out our lasso tool. I don't do pen tool, guys. And I'm going to make a little selection around this. I do pen tool. But the reason this can be a crude selection is because we're confident we're actually on a pure black background at this point. So when I hit this button, give it a layer mask with a selection present, it's going to clip it like that. Because now we're on pure black. So it's pure black crudely cutting in right to more pure black. There's the shape. So I could feather this mask, but it's it's a moot point because we're on black pixels. Does that make sense? So it's crazy how you can go from looking convoluted to being in a pretty clean render environment in like a few adjustments. That excites me. Now we have these little areas that are really the only tricky spots like that. And that's kind of annoying. Now you notice I didn't just crudely cut this out. I left it retainable. I left it editable. So what I'm going to do is the same thing with this solution. I'll make a new layer. I'll fill it in with black pixels. Should I name it? I'll name it Fix, but I guess everything you do in Photoshop is kind of a fix. I'll hold Alt and click this Give It a Mask button, and that'll by default, by holding Alt, give it a black mask, which will emit it from showing up. And I'll just zoom in here with my polygonal lasso tool, and I'll just pretty quickly cut this out. It doesn't have to be too good. Once I've made that selection, I'll go ahead and zoom out, and again, I'll paste white into that mask, which will om not omit, it'll allow those pixels to show up. So there you go. Now if you zoom in extremely, and whenever these grid lines come up, hit Control H, it'll remove extras and make it easier for you to see. If I raise the feather a little bit, you see it blurs, and naturally your focus, unless you're you know, an all-star, I just said I'm shooting with a D5100 and a kit lens, so cut me some slack over here, your focus is naturally going to fall off. So even to the tune of a part of a pixel, it's nice to have that kind of feather out like that. I think in case someone wants to zoom in and be uh, scrutinizing your image. Now up here, uh, that's actually really easy. I could have looked at, more down at the watch or changed my composition, but to stay omniscient, I liked that composition. So what I'm going to do is just get out the magnetic lasso tool. Believe it or not. And I'll do a really crude selection just to show you again. You could make a layer. You could give it a layer mask with this button and just simply fill in black pixels and maybe a bit of feather to do that some justice. But that was a quick solution on that front. Now you see how the dial got screwed up at some point. I think I know what happened. Our top scrim actually bled out. So once again, I will click the layer mask, hit B to bring up my brush, bring black into the foreground, and I will omit the lighten layer from showing up over there. I do kind of miss the brightness on the right hand side of the image. So why don't I curve up, which looks insane, but then I'll hit control I to invert my mask. It's a reoccurring theme. I'll hit G to bring out my gradient tool. I have a white to transparent gradient. So I'm just going to skirt that in over here, which will just blend in that brightness effect from the right. And that's pretty heavy, but I can reduce that. And that's again, kind of like retroactively lighting. The difference is when I bring in light and layers, I'm actually introducing organic information that wasn't there before, which is kind of unique. When you mask a curve layer, you're just taking the info that was already there and just kind of enhancing it, just sort of polishing it up. So there's a difference there, the latter being more susceptible to noise. But I'm just going to grab everything this is a normal part of my workflow. It's like baked into my brain. It's muscle memory. Control G, Control J, Control E. That groups your layer, duplicates your grouping, and then merges the top grouping. What that does is retains all this stuff. You want to make this top light 2% less powerful? Well, that's in here. That's at your fingertips. But you also have a compressed version that you can work with 
to fix little ugly areas kind of easier. I like working on a compressed image eventually, but you got to save all that original info for sure. Now, what I'll do is quickly fix this crown, which we fixed in our original edit, but not this one. I'm going to use the magnetic lasso tool. One person commented every time you use the magnetic lasso tool, they cringe. So this one goes out to that person. Nice and cringy for you. I'm just going to grab that buck wild and make that selection on the fly. Now, we already taught that, so I'm just going to blaze right through this. I clicked that, gave it a mask. And again, I'm kind of redundant here, but I'm just going to move that over a little bit. You know, whatever you think. And then I'm just going to feather that a little bit. All the retouching we did and all of the lighting techniques, the post-production techniques, it also applies if you're going for an organic image, like straight out of camera. Like you'll notice here, I kind of leveraged my Melody by placing it near the side of my watch, giving me a ton of surface area. I could place that more towards the center of the Melody, maybe shoot a blue speed light off this beautiful white background, and I could get something cropped straight out of camera. And there's a place and there's a time for that. You see, you gotta keep in mind how sensitive the angles are. See a ton of highlights disappeared? And this showed up, this lack of a highlight. This is actually coming from the opening of the Melody, and you can try to place this somewhere where it isn't unflattering, or what I typically try to do is place it somewhere where it can easily be retouched via the clone stamp or the pass tool from a candidate in a nearby area. So guys, keep in mind, all of this stuff, I think goes without saying, is subject to color variants, which is an exciting idea. And we covered this in a bit more detail in our previous tutorial using the Melody, so I'll link that in the description. Or hopefully YouTube algorithm can do me a solid and put it in the related. But either way, guys, make sure to tune back in because you know we're going to be uploading some more good stuff. I appreciate you guys all tuning in. And my name is Dustin Dolby. Until I see you next time, you take it easy. Ciao, guys. Mm -hmm.